bring this meeting to order. Um, <clears throat> good afternoon, everyone, and, uh, and welcome to our a public session of our board meeting. We're going to uh, start today's board meeting as per usual with our land acknowledgement uh, statement. Um, let us take a moment to acknowledge that we're on the traditional territory of many nations. In particular, the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe and the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee and the Wendat peoples. We acknowledge that Metrolinx operates on these lands and has a responsibility to work with the original keepers of this territory and the many diverse indigenous peoples living here today. Thank you. Today's agenda includes updates on the Ontario line, uh, the initial business case, the recent GO service expansion, and the initiatives that we're taking to increase ridership on GO. Before we get into these matters, the following correspondence has been distributed to the board. Correspondence from uh, Mathe Bailey dated September 4th, uh, 2019 regarding Metrolinx's zero tolerance policy for fare evasion. Correspondence from Justin Davis dated August the 26th of this year requesting a monthly printed TTC Presto, Presto card and correspondence from Sharon Yetman dated September the 10th regarding transit innovation. Now over to Laura Cook, Chief Communications Officer, who's going to lead us through our safety briefing this morning, uh, this afternoon. And uh, Phil Verster, our CEO, will follow immediately after that with his CEO report. Over to you, Laura. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, in an effort to ensure the safety of everybody in the room, we'd like to walk you through our customary safety briefing before we start the formal meeting. Uh, as a starting point, I'd like to point out some of my colleagues that are going to assist us in the event of an emergency. So Annalise Cherney, uh, sitting in the front row, will be responsible for calling 911 in the event of an emergency. Heather Platt, show you. <laughs> thank you, Heather, uh, will be responsible for escorting emergency services to the meeting room. And our designated first aider today will be Mark Childs, also in the front row. There's a first aid kit a defibrillator and uh, the nearest fire extinguisher are all located in the kitchen or the servery just outside of the, the boardroom here. And in the event of an emergency, if there is an alarm sounded, you'll first hear a slow alarm and what you should do is just stay calm and wait for further instruction. If the second alarm becomes faster and louder, we know that that's our cue to evacuate the building. And if we do have to evacuate, I'm going to ask everybody to head towards the <coughs> stairs, the main set of stairs, just out here outside of the boardroom. And what we'll do is we'll all make our way to our, our point where we meet in the event of an emergency, and that is on the northeast corner of Front Street and York. In a way of doing a head count in emergency, what we like to do is have everybody look to their left, and look to the right and take notice of the people that are sitting next to you so that if there is an emergency, we can all be accountable for a friend or a colleague and make sure that we've got our headcount done. Uh, and then as is also our custom, we like to provide a safety message to everybody here. Um, Annalise and I have been both talking this week about having relatives in, in Nova Scotia. And as you know, the East Coast has been battered by Hurricane Dorian. And you know, although we live in central Canada, sometimes we feel the effects of those weather events as well. Um, but the important thing is we've had relatives without power for a really long time and, and some relatives that are rather vulnerable because they're older and living alone. So it's just a reminder to all of us to always make sure that we're prepared for that type of emergency. Have an emergency kit at home, a supply of water, candles, blankets, just you can decide what goes in that kit but make sure you've got that kit. There's great resources online to know what should go in that kit. And also if you end up in that situation, think about somebody you know who might be alone and vulnerable, perhaps you can help protect them as well. So thank you. Thank you very much Laura. Good afternoon everyone. The past few months have been very busy for us at Metrolinx, and busy in a good way. Um, in August, and, and in, on August the 31st, we added 149 additional services to our daily service plan. Um, and, and there's so many highlights associated with that. We now have weekend services that were seasonal before, is now throughout the year and more. To Niagara, we now, for the first time ever, I think it is, have a GO service every day um, of the year to Niagara. At the same time, we've compared to last year, we've doubled the number of services to Kitchener. Brampton now have um, 
an hourly service throughout the day, um, and that is into the late evening, allow so many more journey purposes, purposes to be met, where people can come into the city and catch a late, late, um, late train home, or go into Brampton and catch a late train back into the city. And on that particular corridor, we've increased services by 45% over the last year, which is exceptional. And then our services on Lakeshore East and Lakeshore West, in particular, has increased as well. And particular to uh, particular to West Harbour, we now have double the number of services in the morning and evening peak. And this all contributes to our overall drive for customer satisfaction and the higher frequency and the higher opportunity, better opportunity to make journey choices using Go. All in all, these services add up to about an 8% increase in services over the last year. And on, on customer experience, we continue to improve on customer experience as well. Last year, we've announced something we've been working on for a period of time, and it's free Wi-Fi services and the rollout of free Wi-Fi services on our buses and trains. And our capital infrastructure works. We can report that in July, we published the initial business case, which we'll discuss today, for the Ontario line. Um, and that's very exciting. Uh, we're moving forward to implement this plan, not only on the Ontario line, but on several of the other um, several of the other subway projects. And we're doing that in collaboration with the TTC and in collaboration with the um, York Region Rapid Transit Corporation. We've also se selected the preferred proponent. We're very, very, very pleased to announce this for constructing the Her Ontario LRT in Mississauga and Brampton which is a great step forward. During the during this last few months, we broke ground um, on Highway 401 stroke 409 along the Kitchener Corridor, and crews will be digging. Don't get, don't get worried. Crews will be digging under 21 live lanes. Um, <laughs> they'll be digging a tunnel, and, and, and obviously we are very ready and very prepared for that. This is a, this is a, a very important tunnel because this gives us the additional track capacity uh, for increasing the service on the Kitchener line in the long run. Eglinton and Crosstown, uh, one of our um, key LRT projects progressing uh, really well. Um, small victories are actually big victories for the communities and we hope, for example, we reopen Leslie Street two weeks ahead of schedule after closure uh, to accommodate construction. It's all in the right spirit of what we're trying to achieve with local communities. We unambiguously appreciate the impact that the Eglinton project has on local communities. And there's no better way to say it, is that we do understand it, we do appreciate it, and we work at our very best to minimize the impact on communities. And we, we know it doesn't always feel like that, but um, we, we work very closely with the community to keep, keep that front of mind. Community engagement continues to, to be very effective, um, and we, we engage communities uh, in all of our projects. We met with 150 community members and stakeholders at our Ask Metrolinks um, town hall in the Peel region um, earlier this month, and we had really robust ch discussions, challenges on the Her Ontario LRT and GO expansion plans and a range of other issues. We have found that this transparency drive that we have with um, Ask Metrolinks has been hugely effective. Um, going out to communities, open session, well published, um, giving people opportunity to still reach us online as well and to participate online, um, and then also ask in person has been very, very beneficial. And we'll continue to do that with great gusto. Um, it's interesting what questions you get. And it's interesting how much the communities appreciate the fact that the whole Metro Metrolink stop team is there and can be called upon to ask any questions. M one of the more fun topics to refer to is our K9 unit. Um, it's amazing how popular this is in our transit safety division and these new officers um, um, that work for us have already made quite an impression on social media and in the news and they are specially trained to su investigate suspicious objects. Primarily our concern is explosives and it's really important to get 
um, give our community that sense that stations such as Union, which is hugely important to our network, has that type of security, um, security layer of certainty that we bring to our operation. As we do at these board meetings, I'd like to take a few moments um, and ask some of our board members that will participate in this to help us to recognize employees, um, both of our own company and other companies, and very often members of the public as well, to support me in, in thanking people that have been exceptional in keeping with our customer and safety charters. And I'd like to start with Jason Green. One of Jason, if you can come forward, please. One of our performance uh, compliance officers who personally returned a wallet to a customer after it was found on a train at the Whitby Maintenance and Storage Facility. And that night when it happened, I remember texting you <laughs> and, and saying to you, that is so commendable. Um, when someone, I lose my wallet often. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and I, I just, think our first thing is cell phones and then wallets. <laughs> yes. yeah. Yeah. I want you from now on to be looking out for my wallet. <laughs> <laughs> and this kind of behavior embodies our commitment to delight our customers and to help them quickly and courteously. Jason, fantastic. Um, customer wrote in to express his appreciation for his significant appreciation for what you've done. And Luigi, uh, Luigi is going to thank you. Thank you. Again. Also want to recognize our customer service ambassador, Chris Giamo. Chris, you recognize Chris. Is Chris here? Chris, come forward. Chris, you recognize that one of our regular customers and his guide dog needed help to make it from one platform to another after a last minute change, went to his assistance and assured he got to the correct platform, boarded the train. Fantastic. We appreciate this. You know, small step initiatives have big impacts for people. And Cleo um, will, give you, will give you a letter of recognition. Thanks, Cleo. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Yeah. During the last quarter, um, the CTS team, um, Crosslinks team, that's building Forest Hill Station on the Eglin and Crosstown LRT project, was achieved a remarkable, what we call in the industry, 365 perfect days. That is 365 days with no lost time due to an injury. And, and this is a fantastic achievement. This is not the type of thing that just happens uh, because people stick to rules. This happens because of behaviors and the way teams are managed. And it's my pleasure to ask uh, Jesse Galdart, a superintendent at Forest Hill Station for CTS, to join us in the front, and then to ask Emily to present a letter of recognition to Jesse. Thank you, Jesse. Well done. Our safety charter and our throttle control program, this is a program whereby we help crews to um, optim optimally use energy and power on our locos, was recently selected by the Railway Association of Canada um, for the 2019 Environmental Award for the Passenger. And, and in this, it's fantastic for us to recommend and commend our safety and operations team Today, I think it's Steve Kavanagh, Grant McGrath, and Karen Millington that are here that spearheaded these initiatives. Um, please come forward, and I'm asking Michael Karoljevic um, to present letters of recognition to you guys. I, we know that it's been years in the making and a year, years forward into the future that we'll have the benefit from this. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. Now, it's always nice to recognize these accomplishments of what people do in their um, sort of day-to-day -day duties, and, and it's fantastic. But I have a, a special opportunity today to also thank two women. 
um, that have shown fantastic development and make huge leadership contributions to our organization. Unfortunately, one of them have decided to resign and go do other stuff, but, <laughs> but Lorraine will forgive you for that. Uh, but I would like to start with, and, and the two women are Lorraine and Lorraine Hunick and Annelise Cherning. But I'll start with Lorraine. Lorraine has been named to the Urban Land Institute 2019 Women's Leadership Initiative Championship Team. I've never had such a long title. <laughs> but. ULI um, established the Women's Leadership Initiative in 2014 with a mandate to advance and recognize women leaders in the real estate in Toronto, which Lorraine is. Lorraine, you've made a fantastic contribution to, um, to our organization, and it's just, it's, it breaks my heart that you're leaving, and I'll have to talk to you later about that. <laughs> And Elise is one of our 35 women chosen in, and, and this is no small um, achievement, uh, chosen worldwide to participate in an exclusive Women's Forum Fellows Program. A rigorous 20-day leadership and executive training session. I'm very proud to say that we strongly supported Annalise's, uh, Annalise's candidacy. Um, I, I threw everything in the kitchen sink into the recommendation. <laughs> And it's fantastic that Annelise have been selected to do that, and congratulations. You're wonderful. Does wonderful. she get to come back and tell you how to run the place? <laughs> She's joined at the hip with us. So. <laughs> Annelise, great stuff. Um, and before we continue with our agenda, there's something in our goings around in, across the business that we, that we saw, and I want to thank, uh, firstly thank, and then also ask Jamie uh, and Louisa Sadowski um, from our communications division to present a video of what is a spoken word, um, a spoken word poem that was developed very much on Louisa's uh, initiative um, for our Finch West, LRT. And this is part of our community engagement. It's part of describing through the spoken word um, what this LRT is going to do in the local community and has had a huge uptake um, locally in the community and it's just a different way to talk about what it is Metrolinx does. So uh, thanks for the opportunity. Good afternoon. Um, so as folks know, we're building the Finch West LRT. It's a tremendously important transformative project in, in Northwest Toronto. We, off, we challenge the teams, community relations, communications, to look at new innovative ways to communicate with, engage folks, get them excited about the work that we're doing, but also and inform them of our activities and uh, to really build awareness and support. So Louisa Sadowski is my uh, senior manager of community and stakeholder relations for my, our Toronto East projects, and she's doing some really fantastic work in this area. Um, with many of the diverse communities that you see along Finch uh, uh, in that in that area, and uh, so what we want to do is share uh, with you a recent initiative that uh, that she's done that's completed that Phil described and uh, how we came to it and, and what it is and, and how the uh, uh, it's getting some really really good coverage. So, Louisa, thank you, thank you, Jamie. So, um, the Finch West community is actually the fifth most multicultural community in all of Canada. And um, I had an opportunity to communicate the project in an innovative and creative way. And I thought, how can I do that? Well, I remember working with a spoken word artist back when I used to be with the Arts Council. And I recently saw him perform um, at a speech by Margaret Trudeau about the relationship between a mother and a son. So he was talking about a prime minister. And I thought, if he can do a poem about the relationship between the prime minister and his mom, he can do a poem about the Finch West LRT. <laughs> so I started chatting with him. And I I provided him with key messages and you know, I taught him about the community um, after I got to know them and the type of feeling we wanted to invoke. And so he took the key messages and provided me with an abstract. I was absolutely blown away. I started to socialize it with my colleagues and teams at Metrolinx. Um, we've never bridged uh, a gap between transit and poetry, so it was a first for the organization. So I had to get a lot of buy-in and a lot of socializing. 
Um, but then I started to collaborate with marketing and they were so helpful. We produced this film all in house, saving uh, great costs. And um, he presented um, the poem right in the community of Finch West. So everyone started to see themselves in the project and uh, that they're really part of what we're building and transforming for the region. And um, when we launched the video, everyone was, was impressed and started to retweet it from local educators, elected officials, key community stakeholders, and it went completely viral. We have over 3,000 uh, views on it right now, and it's something we now bring into all the schools. So we play the video for all the youth um, that completely resonate with it, because now all of a sudden they think Metrolinx is very cool, and they want to know about everything that we're building. Um, and uh, he also offers his time and volunteers, and is happy to come out to all of our events as much as possible uh, to really connect with the students. And let me tell you, when we did the Walk of Excellence last year with 600 graduate high school students that were about to start the university career. I had a lineup of 200 students that wanted his autograph. <laughs> so he's completely integrated in the project right now and it's just a new innovative way for us to communicate about everything that we're building. Okay. Very good. Yes. See it. Who are we? We are the connectors, moving people to opportunity, from professionals and students to people just like you and me. We move in unity, and as we grow, so does our community. We are here to serve. Inaccessibility is what we aim to alleviate. Our solution is to inspire and to abbreviate, to shorten the long way, to revitalize and innovate, and that's what the LRT can demonstrate. So together, we can reach our destination as we transform our transportation. We move you so you can move others. From the lecture halls to the streets, to the malls where we eat, where we work, where we meet, to our homes where we sleep. We are the commute, with you there and back. And after a long day's work, you'll still be on the right track. Because a car lease is overrated, so you can stop feeling like you've overpaid it and switch to the LRT so you can move more efficiently and save the environment because it's emissions free. Mm -hmm. As you grow, so do we. Connecting you throughout and beyond our municipality, helping your aspirations become reality. We are an investment and we know what time is worth because we are the bridge between convenience and a better earth. So why take the long way when things can be expedited? We're in this for the long run. And we're excited because we're in this together as a region united. Our roots are local, but our branches reach far. So you'll always have a way home, wherever it is that you are. Sure. Is fantastic. Luisa, don't disappear so quickly. That was, <laughs> that was fantastic. Very, very well done. Thank you very much. Okay. I now invite Matthew Gutzka, our Acting Chief Planning Officer, to speak on the Ontario Line initial business case. Well, that, that was really good. That's great. I'm going to Great Thank you. So I'm, I'm also joined by uh, Duncan Law, who is our uh, head sponsor for the subway program, uh, Malcolm Mackay, who is our project sponsor for the Ontario Line, and Becca Nagorski, who is the director for project planning. Um, so we'll... Actually, just before you start, Malcolm, mm -hmm. as this is your... Very welcome. It's your first appearance here. Thank you. Can you give the board a little bit of a background as to uh, your lineage? My lineage. <laughs> okay. So uh, I, um, I am today celebrating my 13-day uh, anniversary with Metrolinx. Um, so I'm fresh out of the box. Um, I was uh, working with TTC on the Relief Line project, which the Ontario Line is, is now replacing. And I was with TTC for 13 years, solving a, a host of problems for them over the course of my time there. I 
help build the Union Station second platform out in front of, uh, so I know this building very, very well. And uh, before that, I have a long history in design, build, uh, delivery projects uh, in the private sector. Thank you very much, Malcolm. And everyone else is well introduced. <laughs> oh, sorry for stopping you there, Matt. No, no, Thank that's you. good. <clears throat> No, it shows what we're what we're building on. So the the resolution today that we're putting forward to do, to, to to you is um, first to present you the um, the contents of the results of the initial business case work that was done. Uh, so the initial business case was published at the end of July, but we uh, now we have the opportunity to present it more in more detail to you, and to ask you to um, uh, so approve these results and the recommendations within to advance the Ontario line to the next stage of project development. So going to the preliminary design phase and towards a preliminary business case, a preliminary design business case that will help to mitigate some of the risks and some of the, and continue to optimize costs and benefits as we've done throughout that first phase of business case work. So just to give a bit of context, um, I, um, so basically, the, the, the initial business case compared uh, the performance of the Ontario Line and uh, Relief Line South with a business as usual uh, scenario to, to look at what the, what the incremental benefits and costs would look like uh, as the basis for an investment decision. So the, the, and the recommendation today is to, uh, given these results, and you'll, we'll present them in detail, Becca will run you through them uh, both from a strategic, economic, and financial perspective. Um, to, we'll, we're recommending to advance this project as it will replace over the relief line south uh, option. Um, so that's the resolution I already mentioned. Just to give you some background, uh, so I had come to you with, um, with Becca in February uh, to present you with an update on the business case work that we were doing both on relief line south, which was already entering preliminary design, and relief line north, which was a little bit behind. Um, the conclusions at the time highlighted the sensitivity of the project to, to the costs and the need to really look at activate all possible levers to optimize the costs and, and the benefits and to, and to kind of push the, the boundaries of value management to really go back to some kind of first principles and examine some, uh, some other untapped opportunities where um, looking into different technologies, looking into better integration of the subway network with the GO network, and looking at um, and starting to already early on look at the delivery, different delivery models to manage all the interface risks that are associated with a, pro with a project of this, of this magnitude. And I'll hand it off to, uh, to Duncan, who will run you through that stage that we're in, and then we'll explain how, how to proceed, and then Becca will tell you some more about the contents of the business case. Thanks, Matthew. Okay, so the, I think it's important to note that the initial business case is, is just that. It's initial in terms of the design stage that we're at and the choices that we make and the design that we, we have available to us. Um, as Matthew says, the, the correspondence between Relief Line South and Ontario Line in a business case term is helpful just to understand the, the need, capacity and, and cost-wise at these stages. Um, and it's a useful comparator, uh, but it's essentially underpinned by the fact that the system needs, needs a capacity solution, uh, and that's what we've been seeking fundamentally to, to determine at this stage. If I just take you on to just explain in, in high-level terms what it is that we're doing, Ontario Line is a, just shy of a 16-kilometre um, transit run from Ontario Place, uh, the exhibition station, through to the, the Science Centre. It's different in many ways. I think most notably uh, we're looking at broadly 50% of that route will be at grade or above ground, um, as opposed to a traditional subway subsurface system brings not only cost savings, but opportunities to innovate on technological advancement. It's different because it's separate to the system. And opportunities like this come along very rarely, in fact, where we can make a change to a system and a progressive change by virtue of the fact that we are separate to it. Opportunity statements. Why are we doing it? Well, fundamentally, the, the area needs this. Uh, the line one congestion is well known and the capacity constraints of it are, are well understood and Becca's work will explain in great detail how we forecast all of that. Um, we need it 
and the opportunity to change is there, um, but this is more than just building a transit system. This is about how we get people to new jobs by reaching new neighbourhoods. It's about bringing business and growth into, into the region. And it's fundamentally about getting people to and from those new places of work or education and home safely to the children at night. My team, the sponsorship team and the programme team are committed entirely now to how we accelerate the right pieces of work and the options that we've got to not only deliver this but deliver it to the timescales we've got and innovate as much as possible along that process. Pastor Becker. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to take you through the, um, the kind of findings and the outcomes um, of the initial business case. I'll echo what Duncan started, started off on, which is that the initial business case is really the first phase of business case analysis that we do. And so accordingly, um, we really focus on the strategic case here because that's what provides us with that benefits map that we then track through the subsequent phases of the project life cycle. This is what tells us what does this project actually do, how does it change the way that people can move through the city, um, and, and those are the things that we then need to make sure as we continue with design that we're preserving. Um, the strategic case, as you can see on this slide, follows along with the, the goals and objectives in the regional transportation plan. So we have continuity from the origins of our, um, of our transit network through to the individual projects. Um, and, and these are just some, pulling out some of the findings of the business case. So we see almost 400,000 daily boardings. Um, following on the problem statement, looking at the impact to line one crowding was really critical. And we do see, um, we do see a, that dip in, um, in demand on line one, which we expected and hoped to see f through this type of intervention. So that gives us a sense of how this new line is, um, is fitting into the transit network. And I'll also add that, that new transit riders figure, which is just in the AM peak hour, so one hour of the day, we're seeing 18,000 people who now no longer need to use their car for their morning commute and are able to use um, are able to use transit and that would reflect people who are taking Ontario line but also people who are now able to travel on line one who today um, look at travel on on the young subway and say oh, it's it's too crowded I'm not going to bother and <coughs> would be afforded that opportunity um, following on we look at the economic case and here we have a benefit cost ratio of um, of nearly 0.9, so slightly below one, which for a major subway project of this cost is around the value that um, that we'd expect. And I'll also point out that we you'll, you'll see a range here, and that reflects the certainty that we have at this early stage in the project. And again, that's what we'd expect to see at this stage in the project. Um, moving on to the financial case, and you'll see um, you'll see the same the same ranges and broken up a little bit into different cost um, into different cost categories. You'll also see that we've made some very initial uh, very initial thinking on um, what kind of cost adjustment we could expect to see using a P3 delivery model. Um, the other thing I'll highlight quickly on the financial case is that um, one of the things in, in thinking about those objectives that we started with, how can we um, how can we really value manage this project? We did break down a capital cost per kilometer um, in comparison to Relief Line. We've also looked at this in comparison to other subway projects, and I think you can see some of the value that we were seeing with um, with the Ontario Line design um, and that bottom row. Um, and lastly, the deliverability and operations case, which um, in an IBC is really just outlining what are the key risks that you see and what are the things that we need to focus on as we move ahead with design. So we're looking here with Ontario Line at things like um, managing the managing construction on on go on the go corridors where we're pursuing go expansion and at the same time um, working on the Ontario Line. Um, so so that's uh, around East Harbour and um, at, and at exhibition. Um, looking at those Don River crossings, which, which you know, you know, are are going to be a challenge, and we're up for that challenge. Um, and then the last thing that I'll I'll bring is um, we've also done a, a third party independent review. We asked. Um, Professor Stephen Farber and, and Jeff Allen, who's a PhD candidate at the University of Toronto, to take a look at um, at our work and do an assessment of the impacts, the, the socioeconomic benefits and, and impacts. You, this is what they do. This is their um, their expertise in terms of assessing the geographic impacts to, to different groups. 
Um, and so they have established methodology, and they were able to do a finer grained analysis um, and using some more sophisticated methods than we typically would, looking at groups like um, people who are unemployed, people who are newcomers to Canada, and, and parsing out um, different effects on, on different specific groups. And we've highlighted some of those here. The, the finding that I thought was the most interesting, and this was um, this was a point that they that they um, they typically pursue in this type of analysis was to look not not just at access to jobs, which is something that we do for almost any project, but to say you know when you build a new major transit project into a downtown, you're looking at access to to new jobs like Bay Street lawyers and and bankers. Well, that's not really that's not really that helpful to low income folks where that's not the that may not be the kind of job that they're getting. What about access to low income jobs to really parse out how the line might affect different groups of people? Um, and there you see in that top map that we're also seeing some significant benefits in access to low-income jobs. Okay, great. So just talking to you about progress. So the, the work that Becca and her team have done in developing the IBC has effectively given me the, the targets to aim for. So we know where the, where the benefits can be, can be gained. Uh, we need to find innovative solutions to get, get the route across those, those uh, trajectories. The, the work that we've done so far has been nothing short of fantastic, I think. Um, we working very closely with uh, colleagues at TTC and the City of Toronto, in around a six week period managed to do a piece of work that effectively established the reference alignment, which Becker and her team could then use to calculate some of the, the economic and transport benefits against. Uh, Running a business case in parallel like that is almost unique in my uh, in my experience. I've uh, I've come across from the UK with over a decade of experience, a major program sponsorship, and these things tend to run sequentially. So running them in parallel um, has been both a challenge and quite a good learning experience, I think, for for all the teams involved. Um, we've been establishing new governance, new ways of working within the team. Um, up strengthening uh, Metrolinx as an organisation, but also how well we engage with some of our other, other partners uh, so that everybody has clarity of a message. It's been incredibly important and we've been working closely with, again, TTC and uh, colleagues at the city to provide the best possible information to their council, uh, which, is, which is a process that's ongoing at the moment. We've been and are in the process of recruiting quality people, top talent like Malcolm and others, uh, are joining us now every day, it feels, um, into a facility that we've secured in, in the town, uh, in the city rather, that is a one-team facility. So the Subways programme will be a programme and it will feel like one team because it needs to be one team. We're tapping into all of the best system knowledge that we can to make sure again that we can accelerate on the right works and in the right way to deliver uh, to the 27 target. Value management and scope is a sponsor's byproduct, really. Um, we are trained to look at and challenge preconceived views and opinions of how things have been done and take people to places where they perhaps could be done and we could innovate slightly better, uh, whether that's to provide greater benefit or just cost avoidance, both are good. Um, let me talk to you just for a moment about early works. So again, when we talk about change, what does it really mean? Well, I think the, the standard approach to these sort of schemes would be that you would bundle it all up into one procurement model um, and deliver it under, under one control. We're not going to do that. We are exploring every day different ways of breaking apart the, the scope of the project so that we can accelerate early works that are critical to the programme from a, a safety point of view or from a schedule point of view, but also to demonstrate the progress that's needed uh, in order to, to basically prove to people that we mean what we say when we're going to meet the deadlines. Um, how we separate those out is quite interesting. Um, we, at this stage of a design, are looking at the interfaces that we have with other major works in the area. We're at the process of refining what we think are now our options ahead of being able to consult with public and other stakeholders. Uh, and this is an iterative process. And as, as Mattia and Becker have both said uh, in the presentation, we are at a fairly early stage. And whilst we're moving at pace, we've still got a governance, we've got a programme lifecycle model that we're going to uh, adhere to and just make sure that we've done all the right things in the right way, but at a speed that is appropriate to the, uh, to the operation that we've got. Malcolm, do you want to talk a little bit about just highlights of 
items or part of the network where the early works would be focusing on? Sure, there, there's, a, there's a number of early works that we're looking at uh, right now. It's, uh, it's largely in the coordination with the uh, large programs that are in the corridor so that we can leverage up the existing consultants and contractors that are available so that we can expeditiously deal with that work and deliver it, as well as de-risk the project uh, and all the projects in the corridor during that delivery process. We're also looking at transit-oriented development opportunities throughout the entire alignment to get uh, DEVCOs on board to help us with the uh, delivery of some stations works. We're naturally looking over at the uh, exhibition uh, precinct area for opportunities there for both TOD, early works, launch sites. So there's a whole host of uh, items that we're looking at to improve schedule, cost, and de-risk the project. Let's be specific on those four areas which we've identified, the bridge structures. Right, so through the, uh, the East Harbor area, which we call Portal to Portal, which is the Don Yard up to Girard, we're looking at uh, north of the eastern bridge up to the portal to utilize existing contracts and, and uh, contracts that are going to be in place to deliver the six tra track structure north of that from the uh, Don Valley Parkway uh, to the uh, eastern uh, bridge. We're looking at leveraging up the uh, first Gulf uh, uh, builder and developer there to help us deliver those sites. And then we're looking at bringing on uh, early uh, design work for the bridges uh, across the Don Valley, Don River, over across into the Don, Don Yard, where we're intending to pre-build portals or launch sites if necessary for tunnel boring machines uh, to be able to de-risk and well coordinate with our, our, our brothers and sisters uh, in Metrolinx who are also doing works in these very busy areas. Very, very clear idea of what we'll do as early works and which will separate out from the main contract. Thank you very much. Next steps, do we? Yes, just <clears throat> to, to go quickly to the next step. So as, as Malcolm mentioned, it's how do we, uh, so transferring the, the contracts, the existing contracts to build on the knowledge and the learnings of what, what TTC had started, especially on the Queen Street corridor, which has a number of challenges. Um, to finalize the, the analysis on procurement, to be able to steer these contracts towards the, the, the types of deliverables that are needed for the delivery uh, method that will, that will help us best kind of manage the, the risks. And then, so initiate the studies to be able to uh, finalize the environmental assessments for, for the new Ontario line, and as Malcolm mentioned, uh, analysis of TOD. Uh, opportunities and and in parallel to all that, there's uh, there will be a big a big piece of work related to community engagement. So uh, to be able to uh, continue the engagement that that has been led by the city uh, and by the TTC and and set expectations with them for uh, going forward, both to understand the, the, the different concerns. The, the, the project has changed, so there's new uh, concerns, or, um, and so we have to continue to develop the mitigation strategies, explain them, explain how we're going to deal with noise. I, I think it'll, um, there are some concerns on what happens when you are at grade as, as opposed to below grade. How do we mitigate that? What does that mean compared to a heavy rail corridor to get the references right and to continue to build that relationship with the, with the community? The engagement is also with uh, with industry interests, uh, with pot both kind of on the developer side for the TOD and with potential bidders to grow the appetite for this uh, project and and help them to get ready and be in the starting blocks for the the request for proposals that were uh, and qualifications that will be um, that we're aiming at uh, delivering in 2020 in the spring and in the fall. So open for questions. So uh, why don't I open it up to questions? And you know, this is a, a really exciting project. And uh, you know, when you look at the uh, conceptual pictures, you've at the end, it, it looks fantastic. Um, but I'm sure that the board has a number of questions they'd like to ask on this project. So, Michael, sure, if I may. Um, thank you, group. That's a very comprehensive uh, report. Um, just a couple of points of clarity. Um, I mean, anyone who lives in the city has been following the debate of the original relief line, and I think what a lot of people don't know is that that relief line has been in the in the news for probably the last 20 years. A lot of different discussions and different alignments. 
now that it looks like we've got a, a potential alignment uh, and there has been work done on the relief line, how much of that uh, work and analysis and thinking uh, are we going to be able to take advantage of and, and use as part of uh, our analysis and your analysis on a go forward? Well, I think I, I can start it. Then Malcolm can 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 build on it. He has extensive knowledge. We're, we're working with him we on relief lines so, <laughs> before, and so now we're we're working even more more closely together. The whole, I mean, everything that the city has learned underneath the Queen Street corridor, which is a really complicated corridor to to build under, this is all information that really feeds into the the project. So all of that will be will be really an, an incredible. Uh, asset and a, and a kind of step forward that we can that we can use. Uh, so there's there's tremendous amount of work that uh, that can be used from the previous project. And actually, the extension to the north is partly, at least from an optioneering perspective, was built on uh, some of the preferred options that we had identified for relief line north too. So uh, that were in the IBC stage where we were we had been working also with the city and TTC. So we're using kind of the these two sets of pieces of work together. But, and Malcolm can tell you maybe a bit more about it. Right. So I I, I was the lead on the uh, the relief line bringing it. Uh, through its 15% uh, milestone at the beginning of this year and subsequently went into a value engineering exercise. Uh, all of that work, uh, whether, whether it be specifically detailed to the locations or broaderly um, uh, applied across the subway is, is what we're bringing uh, across the table. So, you know, specifically wise, you know, a, a, a borehole uh, located in a station where we don't have a station anymore, uh, it's, it's representative of geologic uh, profiles, so we'll, we'll use those and, and we will be able to leverage up a lot of the work that's been done there uh, to uh, accelerate the work that we're doing right now. It also puts forward strategies that we've looked into that were maybe not as successful and you know, we, we won't go down those same paths. Excellent. Thank you. And I'm happy to see that uh, we're uh, using some of the knowledge that the TTC has brought uh, into, our, uh, into our new plans. Thank you. Other questions? Just uh, if I could, a couple. The um, uh, back towards the end of the package, uh, I've got page 84 and 85. There's some construction challenges that haven't been fully fest, uh, worked out yet. And the North uh, Don Crossing and the other stuff. Is there anything in your analysis to date that would suggest they'd be showstoppers and really change the economics of this thing? And maybe have us reconsider whether this is a, a viable project? Uh, the, the, the answer is no, not at all at this stage. Um, I think the, the benefit here is that we see these risks now um, and we can, we can identify them um, with the power of the program team, start to understand how we best mitigate that. There are undoubtedly several complex challenges ahead of us. Um, but again, it's about having the confidence in the team to work through those uh, in, a, in a structured manner. Um, going back to the point I made uh, earlier on, the, the objective of the exercise here is to deliver this and to get people to and from new employment opportunities and home safely of an evening. So the ability to interface with the gold corridors and take that urban to regional uh, network change is one of the key benefits that we've got to find a solution for. Um, and that's where the Metrolink's sort of sponsorship and life cycle methodology pays dividends, really. Um, these challenges are challenges, but we've got to find ways to, to deliver on them. And my other question is somewhat related, although I think Michael's question got to part of it. You've, you've been able to utilize a lot of the homework that was done for the initial uh, proposed Southern Relief Line. Um, are there any other environmental assessments that still need to be completed for this project? Yes, several. Um, we're looking at a addendums to some of the environmental assessments. Um, assessments on a, on a program of this sort of scale are almost limitless. Um, we need to assess public confidence and, and, and optioneering that we might go through, through to some technical technical optioneering that will probably remain within a program environment, but it's <coughs> challenging. So yes, we, we have... A, a significant mountain to climb, but we've got the right team to get there. And, and talk a little bit, Duncan, about especially the assessments we've let as additional contracts already uh, for the north as well as for the west? 
Yeah, so do you want to tell us something, Malcolm? Yeah, yes, so uh, we've engaged uh, <coughs> consultants for the broad uh, um, environmental assessment process across the in entire alignment. You know, one of the good things about uh, uh, subways is they uh, they tend to be environmentally positive, and uh, we, we, we tend to have a fairly easy go. The, you know, the elevated sections, sure, they provide us with, with challenges, but they're not challenges that are difficult to overcome. So from an environmental point of view, it, it's a matter of getting out and having public engagement, getting that feedback from the public so that we can incorporate it into, into our, our designs and, and deliver the project. So without a doubt, uh, the environmental assessment is well set up right now to go forward and uh, be completed in, in a time frame that will allow us to go to market uh, accordingly. Great. Yes. So one of the uh, important aspects of the project when it was first conceived was this notion of relieving pressure on line one. So uh, I think the public and people in, uh, in general, we as board members, would like to understand uh, how does this project actually help that problem. And what work is the CDC doing to actually help alleviate that as well? Because this project is, certainly has a timeline, and I'm thinking of signaling processes that are already in place. And I think the, budget, the public needs to be educated a little bit as we as board members on how this project and work that's already happening with the CDC will help that problem. So I, I can speak to some of the work that TTC is undertaking. Obviously, they uh, they initially bought the uh, the new Toronto rocket trains, which had the through walkways, which increased the capacity of the trains, which therefore increased the throughput. TTC is also rigorously improving day to day their uh, main stations. You'll see in in Young and Bluer and um, St. George, they've now put painted tiles on the floor to try and keep the openings uh, to and from the door and people boarding to the sides. That helps uh, reduce the dwell time, which helps put uh, uh, more and more trains through, which increases capacity. They also have their ATC project, which is coming online throughout the alignment. The final uh, opening of that, I'm not quite sure what the, the date, dates are, Just but they have... That ATC is automatic train control. That's the signaling system supporting yes. the trains. Yes. Because we've got a public audience that may not be familiar. Well, of course. We're yes. acronym free here. <laughs> okay, sorry. Uh, no problem. So, so the automatic train control allows us to run the trains closer and closer together. Again, more trains through the system to increase capacity. So uh, as well, uh, TTC has a program that they're developing right now that looks at all things on line one and how they can achieve more and more capacity. Uh, that said, one of our mandates on the Ontario line and one of our number one objectives is to provide relief. And uh, the first place we provide relief is make sure that at uh, Pape Station, we have an attractive transfer there so that people will get off of line two, not go, or get off of, yeah, get off of line two, go on to the Ontario line rather than passing through the Young Bluer station which also has a very large program that's being delivered by the TTC. So without a doubt, uh, the line one capacity issue is a focus of both Metrolinx and the TTC and the City of Toronto, because it, it, it is a, 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 a real problem that we have to address. So the, the, the alignment that we're looking at now for the Ontario line going north of Pape, intercepting the, uh, the new Eglinton Crosstown, Ad advancing that is is a beautiful addition to relief uh, to line one. Thank you. Robert, you had a question? Uh, yes, thank you. And uh, first of all, I just want to thank you back on the social economic because I, I think that gets lost often in these discussions around subways. And um, everything that I've understood is that you can really lift families by putting them near transit. And I think, you know, it's good that you did that work um, with, with the University of Toronto and so forth. Uh, my question relates to the benefit cost ratio. Um, and uh, I was uh, pleased to see that, you know, you did some, uh, some uh, modeling around P3s and P3s appeared to lift that. Um, 
We're not at one though, and we're not, uh, we don't have a, a what I call positive uh, benefit case, but can you enlighten me <coughs> to how this would line up or compare it to other subway projects? Because I, uh, my, I feel, at least on the surface, that this is probably um, a pretty good subway case. That I just, but I, I don't have a you know reference point for that. Mm -hmm. No, that's definitely a very, that's a, a very good project for for a subway project. I think a lot of the um, the only way to get beyond one is to be either with projects with very little infrastructure or to optimize existing infrastructure. So the Go expansion program, I think a lot of its performance is because it's it's working also with a legacy infrastructure that it can optimize. Here with a brand new with a brand new project, it's it's more difficult to achieve that. So it's not it's not rare to be in BCR um, uh, in BCR levels that are more about around the 0.5 uh, for a subway. Um, in in many other countries, actually, they've for subways they. Um, and for other modes, they, they kind of change the evaluation model to look at uh, also the, the city building impacts of that because these are hard to, to, to get back into the transit benefits. And so there's other modeling techniques to be able to evaluate some of the stuff that we're not evaluating here with that strict kind of transit and time savings approach. But here I think with, um, with, the, with the P3 and with the risk management uh, that, that's enabled to to really kind of control that risk and control all these interfaces risk, we're, we'll be close to one. And we'll continue to uh, value manage as the project progresses, and I think, and continue to work al also on the benefits. And TOD will be a contributor to that, both from a benefit standpoint, any kind of intensification around the stations will generate new ridership, especially for if, um, if we have employment. I think around East Harbor, that's kind of key to getting some counter peak ridership, for example. And then the actual benefit the, the, the financial cost also will be alleviated by um, by the TOD uh, interest and initiatives. I think just a, just as another thought, we've standardised on a 60-year um, evaluation period, um, and n n just not being facetious, but tunnels get built with an expectation of life much longer than 60 years, and so so therefore, the evaluation of the full project benefit gets to be an issue of at what what's the discounting rate from where we are now and what does future benefits in the further years add up to. And therefore, Matthew's explanation is exactly the right space to be in, is the impact that it has within the city, accepting that you have to be underground, which is the most expensive way to build, um, is therefore complemented by benefits outside of transit, pure transit benefits. And so we do not consider benefits outside of pure transit benefits in our business cases because the, you have to draw a line in terms of what goes into the basket of benefits you evaluate and economic, socioeconomic benefits and benefits, wider economic benefits outside of pure transit benefits would make nearly every transit business case a good one. So we have to stick to transit benefits only, which is the right way, and then we advise the shareholder, and the shareholder incorporates those wider benefits in their decision. Right, so even though that we have, we're talking about direct benefits here, and we're talking, uh, notwithstanding that we have ranges, we could still see an improvement of, um, you know, in a future business case. These could improve these benefits. Yeah, if you consider the full business case, yeah. not the yeah. full transit business case. The transit business case could always be for, for, for tunnel solutions and subways, would, would also be touch and go whether it makes that, uh, that, that magical figure of one. But when you consider the wider economic benefits, where it is in cities typically where you find subways, the wider economic benefits are hugely um, additive but they're not in our calculation. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Malcolm just uh, hinted, reminded me that also it's, it, it does enable, it does support other projects uh, where we're not directly calculating everything because we, we, we model everything on the existing and the forecasted uh, network, but it does enable the Young North uh, subway extension too. So there's ultimate ulterior uh, benefits that, that can also be added to the mix. Good to know. Good. Emily. Um, Question on community engagement. Um, just the sentence about Metrolinx and infrastructure working with TTC and City of Toronto. Um, is this becoming a four-headed beast? Is there a transfer of relationship on community engagement, or is it sort of ha at the project one team? So we have sort of ownership of community engagement on the, by the team. Just trying to understand sort of accountabilities there. 
So, so I, I take accountability for it. I think okay. this is a, this is a Metrolinks uh, it's a Metrolinks program. Um, we are working closely with Laura and her team to develop a communication strategy of how we go out and deal with community groups and other stakeholder groups. Um, it, it, it has to. You, you can't run these things with multiple multiple owners. We, we've got to take accountability for it, and that's uh, by and large my role sitting here now. Any other questions? Okay. Um, there's a motion before us uh, to to uh, approve uh, this business case, um, and I have somebody make the motion. Uh, thank you, Paul, and uh, a seconder. Thank you, Ann. Um, any further discussion before we vote? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Pass. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. An Thank excellent you. presentation. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I look forward to seeing the bridge solution. Yeah, that's right. Okay, the next one is Ian and Mark on the uh, service expansion. Good afternoon, yes, Ian Smith, Deputy Chief Operating Officer, and Mark Childs, who you all know. <laughs> um, so, yes, so today I wanted to give you an update and a bit more of an insight into one of our key objectives this year, which is increasing our services to increase our ridership. Uh, now, Phil gave in his uh, opening presentation there quite a bit of insight into the numbers and the facts and figures, so I won't touch on those too much, but I think what I just want to allude to is the last couple of bullet points on this slide, which is about um, what we're doing and why we're doing and what we're looking forward to in the future. I think from my experience here, um, service expansion has been a little bit double-edged at times. One, we've wanted to do it, there's been a huge pride and passion to get it done, but sometimes the implementation of it has caused us some problems, a bit of growing pains, would I say. So one of the key, key areas here was to make sure that we really interlocked better and got far more collaborative behind the scenes on demand-based ridership, the logistical challenges of delivery, and then actually how we then implement the service. Now, so August the 31st was quite a momentous day for all of us in here in Metrolinx, uh, particularly as it was obviously coming off the back of uh, uh, going, sorry, going into Labor Day and coming off the back of Labor Day for that Tuesday, but in terms of the level of service that we needed to uh, put in. And I have to say, to get to that point in crescendo, uh, uh, the amount of work that went in behind the scenes, just to give you a bit of a feel for it, um, we put a new team together, which was led by our customer service delivery uh, uh, Vice President's team and the Director there, Shannon, and the, there was over 500 lines of work of entry and actions that needed to take place to just get us to that start point where we could run the services. We also got some really, really strong collaboration with our contractors and partners, particularly the freight partners, uh, CN and CP. CN in particular, the amount of work that we did with CN in the upfront to unlock some capacity and hopefully stabilise some of our train paths as how the interface with freight um, was very commendable and that actually helped us unlock some of the benefits that we had today and also Bombardier our, who, with our um, ops transit teams in ensuring that we had enough crew and enough cars and enough locos to meet the service expansion as well was no uh, short uh, job there. It was really quite detailed to be done. So more trains, more options you have seen, and I think Phil gave a really good update. Uh, I have to say, when we do the demand capacity thing uh, through here, we look at all parts of our services, not just the train. We do look at the buses um, as well. And as you've seen, there are some changes that sometimes happen with modal shift between buses and trains. Uh, but also, we do take the opportunity to uh, review the uh, bus network, and we did put back more services, uh, for, particularly for the school runs, um, which weren't there before, as well as changes some of our bus trips around the new trains operation that we put in place. So when we say when we prepare, 
I just really gave an overview of what that was. But I think I'm just going to say there's three things which we try and lock into place uh, for preparation. We've done all that demand management uh, elements there, but when it actually comes to the delivery, um, we, it, it, we really try to lock into place. First and foremost is the customer experience. No, it's great as changing plans, but if we change plans and then we're not able to articulate those well to our customers, we can actually create problems when we think we're actually delivering uh, solutions. Um, secondly, it's the service delivery, and that is that logistics piece which I just mentioned. But thirdly, and you could say this is the first uh, piece if we get it wrong, is safety. And all the elements that I went through of those plans, we did a thorough safety validation process run independently by our safety team to ensure that we weren't just being too, um, I would say, like, like, we weren't being too optimistic in what we could deliver and we weren't in any way importing safety that we didn't then think we could manage. Those three elements of safety, customer delivery and logistics really come to a head when you look at places like Union Station. Um, I know as a commuter myself, the last thing that you really want is change, and if you've been used to the last 10 years catching your train from a certain platform going in through a certain door, to have that uplift and change um, can be quite problematic, particularly as you're probably similar to me, when you get into that rhythm and routine, I would tend not to listen to anybody, I would just go and do my own thing. So really breaking into that, um, I think the Union Station people did a really, really top job, and as well as yesterday as well when we had another whole load of uh, platform changes, because actually a lot of these changes, we're going to have more of this to come. Um, just as we redevelop and rebuild uh, Union. So it's really important that we bring our customers uh, with us. Now, I'm kind of looking at internally a bit now to think, I think we did a good job, but to ensure that we know, because I'm sure there's things we can do differently, um, we'll be now sending out to uh, customers, those who are interested, as a feedback questionnaire, so we can really get from customers themselves how it's worked for them, areas which did work well, and maybe areas where we thought we were doing a good job, maybe we can then go and improve further. Mark. Yes, so uh, as Ian said, you know, preparation for a significant change after a long weekend uh, and back to routine uh, is, is certainly no easy feat. And, and certainly, um, you know, the, the collaborative working level teams um, covered all the bases. I, I would like to call out one particular um, um, uh, initiative that we deployed to ensure that we got early feedback from our customers. We do have our Customer Experience Advisory Committee uh, that's chaired by, by Clio, um, and we did do an early check in with, uh, with those advisors to get their perspective on the times for change and the scale of, and scope of this change. Um, and as a combined team, deployed a communication strategy that went from sort of ground up um, with new iconography. We believe it's, it's cleaner, it's brighter, it's more visible, um, literally on the station ground, um, clearly signifying changes. Um, but also, uh, following the announcement, working with our communication partners, deployed a full communication strategy leading up to August 31st, um, which deployed some of the proven tactics that we've had, particularly over the last uh, six months, um, and we've seen some, some, some increased success in that regard. So using animation techniques in social and digital channels um, to sort of draw attention um, to the changes, um, specifically delivered um, geographically uh, by corridor. Um, and what we saw successfully um, in the weeks leading on the weeks leading up to August 31st was actually an increase of 40% of traffic to our web pages, custom web pages to help customers learn about the changes. So again, fine tuning our deployment model up to uh, the point of, uh, of launch. We also saw uh, increased uh, traffic coming from social channels. So seeing really how we can really bring that that expertise and that continuous learning uh, to improve. Um, after um, the changes, of course, we, we now uh, have moved into the next phase of, of helping um, residents across the region um, understand uh, and see potential uh, for uh, taking uh, new and different trips uh, into and out of uh, the city using uh, the new services that have come into play. Uh, and as Phil had uh, so eloquently uh, mentioned, many, many new trips uh, for folks from Bramley and even from Kitchener coming into the city and back home uh, during the evening hours. And uh, anecdotally, we, we know that uh, the three o'clock train from Kitchener uh, into Toronto last Friday, seemingly timed with Sean Mendez's concert. Um, 
uh, was a very, uh, very, very well-frequented train. But uh, sort of joking aside, um, the team has developed uh, um, a number of, uh, of, of advertising assets that are not only now um, appearing in social media channels, um, talking about uh, increased uh, express um, um, and um, rush hour options for West Harbor, but talking about being able to get into Toronto or out for dinner and a show, dinner and a game. So really putting the idea of new reasons to take go. Um, out there are over seven combinations that we're deploying, uh, both based on audience, based on uh, ge uh, geographic location, um, and, and using with that optimization tools in search uh, engine uh, marketing um, and our digital assets. Uh, we've seen very early, it's, it's literally 10 days since we, we launched the service, but we're seeing really solid results, uh, particularly from the social media channels. And I should point out, it's not just a digital campaign. We're bringing those uh, messages to life, um, trip purpose, journey purpose, why you'd take the train uh, to life um, in, in real time. Uh, Union Station now has new advertising uh, um, actually posted on the walls. Um, and uh, most importantly, we now, and you'll hear from the team that's going to follow us, a little bit more about the opportunity not just to use Presto, but for those folks that may not have taken us before or take us infrequently, an opportunity to buy a digital ticket um, right from the advertising that they, they may be inter interacting with uh, that might intrigue them to take go. Um, so a lot more to come, um, and uh, we are uh, um, the, the campaign will continue to run uh, through uh, the end of September, and, and at the next board meeting, we can share more results on, on how uh, those um, uh, campaign supports yeah. performed and also uh, the impact we're seeing on ridership. Yes, thank you. Thank you. That was, that was good. Questions? Just, uh, you're, you're obviously getting people, more people on the GO system <laughs> who are not regular users. I mean, because you can tell, because they're all standing there. You know, totally lost. So I think we need to continue to improve as we are. But I mean, continue to improve the signage. Mm, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, a woman got off the train today, this morning, with a baby carriage, and she headed that way, and the elevator is that way. And yeah. anyway, we didn't manage to catch her, and you know, she'll be all the way back to train. So it's just sort of those simple things that because people don't know which way to go sometimes. So I think we just need to continue to yeah. to make that improvement as we go along with all the new riders. Fully agree, and, and actually, I, I I didn't do something that I promised I would do, so I'll do it now, which is to recognize across Metrolinx the number of volunteers during that first week of service change who donned uh, green green uh, tunics uh, to be able to help um, our riders move from platform. Uh, if the platform changed, find the new trains. I, I know Ian and I were both wearing yeah. high visibility vests that day. Uh, it, it's part of an organization culture that really is passionate about putting customer first. Achoo, do you just want to say something about the trial of the new signage that we have on the union platform? Right, right. So, so we've, we've trialed new signs and we've published also in, in July the new wayfinding standards. Uh, that really sets kind of the, the tone for that idea of progressive disclosure to provide the right information at the right moment and the decision point. And so here in uh, on Union Station, on the platforms, there's also on tracks five and six, uh, we've tried several different types of, uh, of signs, looked at the different sizes, looked at what, how much quantity of information, what do you put to clarify? Because there was some confusion, for example, on car numbers versus platform numbers. So now these are clearly named on, on the sides and actually to bring them to maximize some of their size and to clarify all the access points so that yeah, people are, know they can easily go from one point to another. And then also in Union Station that there's several points, there are several points on the usual itinerary of a lot of users and especially kind of occasional users where they, they come to a point, there's that wall at the bottom of the stairs, just when you, when you, if you get out of Metrolinx, this is a, that's a strange moment, because you feel like you're going into the concourse, and then you have the big wall, and you're kind of lost, and you don't know exactly where the, you are. So we'll have also some, some tactical opportunities, like that place, to really use these places where people have, we know people, customers have a little hesitation to put the right signs in that place to help them, to steer them in, in the right direction. And, and, and simplifies, and sometimes it's simplification of the existing signs. Can I just thank Gunther over there, because Gunther's team, Gunther, apologies, I didn't see you, otherwise I would have asked you. The Gunther's team have been doing sterling work exactly on wayfinding. So the wayfinding is sort of being revolutionized. I can say that word, because it is so very different to where we are now. Thanks, Gunther. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you very much, Devon. Thank you very much. So we'll move on to the ridership initiatives. Ken and Sharon. Thank you. 
Well, good afternoon. It's, it's always nice when you can start off with a bit of good news. So ridership year to date is up 4.1%. I do want to put that number into perspective though, so that's 4.1% and it does not include child boardings because as everybody knows now, kids are riding free since last year. If we factor out child boardings, our ridership actually would have been a 5.2% increase. Um, now to put that number in perspective, I'm a bit competitive, so I like to see how we're doing against the rest of North America. Uh, the rest of North America, using the American Public Transportation Association numbers, so they capture all this information from across transit agencies, they said that commuter rail, which is essentially what GO is, is up 2%, 2.1%. And bus is actually down 1.0%. Our bus is actually up 4.5% in terms of ridership. So relative to the North American average, I think we're doing quite well right now. Everybody's talked about the services, so I'm not going to touch those, but I will talk about things like events. So we had the Raptors event, which was a great um, boost to our ridership numbers. Honda Indy, which is a partnership. The nice thing about Honda Indy, we did it last year, but we saw a 77% increase this year. And one of the things that I personally am enjoying about Metrolinx is that idea of constantly improving and learning from the past. And in this particular case, what we did is we got out to market sooner and we started selling sooner, we integrated better with them. And that's what's contributing to these um, gains of 77%. So we're learning from the things that we're doing. And instead of being afraid to do them again, we're doing them better. And then digital growth. There's the poem really that we all saw and they talked about being relevant going into the schools. And I think this is now age independent. I think when you start talking about digital, everybody's using it, but we need to understand how different folks are using digital technology. So the digital tickets, we've got about 16,000 digital tickets that have been sold. Now this is a current number, so this is going a little bit beyond the July numbers reporting here, but it's talking about how people want to buy tickets from us. So I'm gonna leave it at that and turn it over to Sharon for some of the cool stuff that our team's doing. All right, thank you very much. Um, so I wanted to just share, I'm just not gonna obviously go through the deck, you've obviously all read it, but I wanted to provide some context to some of the content that you've seen. Um, as you know, this summer we launched uh, our Find Your Go Time brand platform, which we were all really, really excited about. Um, so what we wanted to do is, it's a bit navel gazy to say, oh yeah, it's doing amazing. What we wanted to do was actually go out and test it. So we worked with Google and we did what's called a brand lift survey. So we do a pre and a post um, by exposing people to our videos. Um, and the results that came back were actually, they kind of blew Google's mind. Um, it's a best in class campaign, not only for our category, but with kind of the big boys um, in terms of brands. We saw a the 76% consideration and the 77, 77 can't even speak, 77% positive opinion of Go, our top quartile for brands. But what's really interesting is for a brand lift. So brand lift is basically when people see our ads and they go on Google and they search for us. Um, like that's really proactive and positive. And typically in our category, we sit at about 25, 26%. We were at 40%, which is 126% increase, which for a government transit agency brand is just phenomenal. So our team is completely overwhelmed by that. And I will just plug right now that we actually just had two phenomenal articles today um, within the industry for strategy and stimulants. So my phone has been buzzing, so the team is very excited and they just keep talking about it. Um, so our, our, our brand platform has been recognized and it's doing extremely well and we'll continue to grow that and build on that over the next few years. Um, the other piece that I'd like to talk about is um, what we're doing in social. So we've really amped up um, our social media strategy. Uh, we're talking in the internet culture of memes and GIFs. We're actually one of the first brands in North America to actually use branded GIFs and memes. Um, and people love them. And it's driving our engagement rates. And I'm really cheap. And it's great when it drives my engagement rates because it keeps my advertising costs down. And my advertising dollars go a lot further. So. Um, it might seem like a waste of time, but it's not. It's, it's building really good emotional connection to our brands. Um, we talked a little bit about Raptors, so I just wanted to hit on events really, really quickly. Um, we had a great summer of events, and a lot of the success, I would say, was due to the fact that, yes, we went out early, but we went out early and hard with really great breakthrough creative. Um, we had some amazing experiential activations at those events, and, and another great plug for our staff. We had 200 brand ambassadors over the summer, just our staff from across Metrolinx, bus drivers, people front of house, people back of house, that came out and supported those activations 
Ireland, and they got super competitive. We had um, on-the-go alert sign-ups at uh, CNE, for example, and they were like competing with each other. So it was it was really fun. So um, I think uh, as we launch into brand culture later in the fall, I think growing our brand ambassador base is going to be super important, and it also saves us a lot of money. We don't need to hire activation staff, and we really have authenticity as a brand because our employees just love these um, these service brands and our corporate brands so much. Um, we talked um, about trip purpose in the past, and I know that we've talked about kind of the June numbers. Niagara did really well again this year. We saw almost a... Um, a 60% increase in, in ridership over last year. And now that we have year-round service to Niagara, we'll continue to look at other ways that we can grow the partnerships, and not just with, with the local transit, but also with, with bigger partners within the Niagara region itself. But coming up this fall, so just to put this into context, we have about 18 um, events that we've targeted just from October to December. Um, that's double than we've actually done last done since last year. But what we're also doing is we're getting really super targeted. So we're choosing the, um, the event and then the target audience. What's their reason to believe? If it's families, we're promoting kids go free. If it's millennials, we're talking about e-ticketing as a value proposition or like an easy way to get there. Um, if it's people within the 416, we're talking about lower base fare. So we're continuing to drive the value propositions specific to those targets, and then we're taking it into the specific media channels where they are. So with students, we're talking about over 20% discounts, and then we're talking to them in social channels where we know that they're actually receiving our message. Um, Cirque du Soleil is, a, is a, a great highlight here. This is a two and a half month partnership that we have with them. It's not a combo ticketing offer, but it's a, a, an exchange of value and kind. So if you're out on riding the rails, you may see Cirque du Soleil Allegria uh, branded cars. We're going to do, I'm not going to give, they got the cat out of the bag, but we're going to do some super uh, fun stuff with them. Um, and this is a great example of a campaign that will start to drill down into targets, families with kids go free, millennials with e-ticketing, and then lower base fare for, for those within the four and six, and seniors getting, of course, their 50% uh, concession, because even though this isn't your grandpa's go, grandpa's still welcome. Um, <laughs> And e-ticketing, we, we really we talked about that really quickly. This only launched five weeks ago, and we're seeing incredible week over week um, increases. I think there was one week where we saw like a 229% increase in tickets, e-tickets sold. So obviously, <coughs> convenience is a big factor. But for me as a marketer, I finally, through my advertising, get to close the sale with people. I get to say, you can go here right now, like pre-plan your trip, right? Like this is not offering discounts off our, our ticket. Our, paper ticket prices, um, but it's definitely um, helping us drive um, from intention to action, which is uh, fantastic. And I know Ken loves it because data, 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 and he's a big geek. So I would ha like to open up to the floor if you have any questions about any of our ridership initiatives. Questions? So, so it's clear when you go on to buy, like, let's say, a single trip e-ticket that there are presto options, you know, for long, you know, you can That's correct. always have to do a, yeah. a daily ticket. Yeah. Okay. Now, when you actually, when it takes you there, you can compare against the presto price. Okay. Um, and I will have to plug, even though it's great that I'm able to add this across every single piece of advertising that we have in the marketplace, we can drive and close the sale. Actually, about 70% of our tickets are being sold by just links that we've embedded throughout our website. Um, so people are going to go transit, and they're like, oh, I can go buy my ticket now, or plan my journey, I can go buy my ticket now. So we're closing the sale right within the platform. Discuss the example of Velt, the Velt Music Festival and... Sure. So actually, Veld was one of our very, very first um, e-ticketing opportunities. So Veld is an e dance music event. I'm even too old for it, to be honest. Um, and it takes place up... Uh, That's down really depressing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a very young 40. Um, so it takes place up at Dance View every year. It's super popular. Um, I am, like, stumped for numbers, but we saw a lot of activations of people buying e-tickets at Downsview to get home. And we were able to work in partnership with Ops to make sure that our train left just a little bit later so people could stay till the end of the festival. So it's really knowing your audience and, and knowing kind of like where the events are happening and how we work to adjust our service just a little bit, like Sean Mendez, come on. Well, that's <laughs> Kitchener. Um, that was actually, I will say, for an in e ticketing perspective, that was our biggest sales day. It was $11,000 in sales in e tickets just for Sean Mendez, we suspect. <laughs> right. 
Other questions? Just a comment. Um, I was sort of doing a lot of this, looking at the map up close, but the numbers, the 416 numbers on ridership increase are really impressive. So obviously what you're doing is working. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so they're up 7.9%. Uh, we largely attribute it to the lower base fare initiative. So it is really communicating loud and clear that getting the right price for our customers is really important. And I think that's one of the things we've, we did a lot of changes last year and we're spending a lot of time digesting all those changes so we can continue to tweak it to maximize the experience for everybody. And Cleo, you made a great comment last in June when we met about advertising to TTC riders. So you'll be happy to know as part of our planning with our AOR last week for um, the, the remainder of 1920 and out to 2021, we're looking at that 416 because we know that the cognitive load of, of like trying to understand transit is one of the biggest barriers. But when you're talking to people on the TTC, for example, they're already transit natives. So it's just um, talking about our value proposition, whether it's lower base fare or kids go free, and really getting those 416 riders out of the downtown core, but just giving them more reasons to go. You know, I, I, I don't know how the numbers translate, but I like Emily, I was really impressed by the uh, uh, by the average daily uh, numbers coming, especially on Lakeshore East there, Danforth, Eglinton, mm -hmm. Scarborough, that must benefit uh, or, or uh, reduce the burden on the TTC along that same road, eh? See, so. <laughs> the Danforth road? Yeah. So we definitely have a lot of uh, locations in common. And as long as we're in an opportunity or in a position to deliver customers to the same destination, we provide a very attractive alternative to the TTC. Yeah. And we're priced slightly higher, but our environment's a little bit more accommodating, I think. The seats are a little bit more comfortable. You do, do get a seat in most cases. So I think one of the things that we're learning from a lot of the recent price changes is that, well, price is a big factor of it, so is the experience. So it's finding that right price to experience relationship and uh, lower base fare, I think, has priced us in the market, where I think we were priced a little bit out before. I think now we just need to work on the outer regions to figure out where is the right spot for us there. Mm -hmm. cool. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, I'll go over to you for these uh, three appointments. Thank you. I'll be very brief. I think we are formally recognizing Laura, who joined us earlier this summer as our chief communications officer and ran our safety briefing earlier today. So thanks for keeping us safe. Uh, Jennifer Gray is uh, also taking on the title of treasurer as our current treasurer uh, has announced his uh, pending retirement. And we've uh, had a corporate controller join the finance team. Okay. And it's my omission, and I apologize, that I didn't properly introduce Laura. Laura, can you please properly introduce yourself? <laughs> <laughs> Laura has recently joined us as our new uh, Chief of Communications. Yeah, thank you, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I think I'm on day 45, 50, something like that. I'm having an extraordinary time. This is an amazing time to be part of this company. Um, by way of background, I worked at Hydro One where we did a lot of work with communities, First Nations, because we were a linear infrastructure company. So I feel a lot of similarities. But what's surprising me is I also worked at Air Canada. And so the relationship between the commercial aspects of our business, ridership, so on and so forth, is also very familiar. So this is a dream opportunity for me to work with, with all of you, because I feel it's the culmination of an entire career uh, coming into play. So it's been very rewarding so far, and I look forward to so much more. She, she, she said none of that in her one-to-one. -one. Her one-to-one -one was all about the other stuff. It wasn't it about how challenging and how maddening it is. <laughs> I'm a PR person at heart. <laughs> Welcome on board, Lord. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, any, any comments anybody wants to make on these appointments? Can I have a motion, please? Thank you. Thank you. It's almost the same three people. Cleo. Great. <laughs> Seconder. Reg. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Okay, that was unanimous, so from there. Uh, and uh, the last item is quarterly reports. Um, is there anybody who wants to make some comments on these? Should we take them as read, or does uh, anyone want to speak on any of these? Um, yeah, Phil, just on the, the Presto thing, um, if there was anything about your continued efforts to um, 
minimize the uh, sort of TTC criticisms that seem to be, from the reading I've been doing anyway, way off base in terms of what they're saying and how we're trying to, because on the one hand, we're hearing about the great partnership and relationships between TTC folks and our folks on so many projects. You pick up your Toronto Star and it's another missive out of, out of TTC saying we're all, you know, it's, it's all screwed up somehow. So any comments on how we're trying to deal with that? It's, it's very, um, in, it's sometimes very illuminating to try and figure out how some of the messages um, get headline status um, and is not a reflection of what's actually happening on the ground. So first of all, uh, I have to say that collaboration between the TTC and Metrolinx on delivery presto has been excellent. Um, like any uh, huge transformation and change program, it is always uh, challenging uh, because you're changing processes and behaviors and how people deliver, deliver what we do. Um, however, we continue to work very closely with the TTC, we're closely with Rick Leary and his team. Um, there are commercial um, uh, sort of uh, commercial op opportunities that the TTC are exploring with us, which we have very clearly indicated um, that those commercial claims are not valid and that there are other ways to resolve that if they are not in agreement with our decision, and that is to escalate and take it to dispute. And so we've encouraged the TTC to um, to put that behind um, behind us, and let's move forward to look at a, a very exciting delivery program on TTC um, for a future roadmap and for things such as open payments. Um, and so that's that's where we are. Because the numbers of how it's expanded, how the usage has increased, how the satisfaction has increased. I mean, those have been pretty strong numbers, uh, for, again, from what I've been reading in our material. It's, it's very significant. And the TTC adoption is now um, close to 70%, uh, which is a huge level of adoption. Um, we, we, we've got a number of millions of cards in operation every day now. Yeah, and if I may add also, we recently launched cross-boundary service between uh, City of Toronto and York and City of Toronto and Mississauga. We have thousands of rides already and it's only been a couple of weeks. And likewise, Downtown Express, which is only about a week and a half in, has, I'm just pulling up the number, uh, um, uh, sorry, almost a million boardings just with that one piece of functionality. And that was one of those things that the TTC, uh, we had committed and we've rolled out together, like Phil mentioned, in partnership. Uh, likewise, 600,000 tickets sold uh, for infrequent users like visitors and, and uh, new transit riders. So there's lots going on that's been really great. And, and likewise, it's, it's a bit of a shame that the story is not about how well and how we're, we're continuously doing better and are very excited about the future in terms of new payment uh, and better experiences. Um, but, but we're getting there. And, and at least the Presto satisfaction, customer satisfaction rate now is at 76% which for card-based system is, is very, very significant, is a, is a very good place to be. And uh, in, on all accounts, um, customers are satisfied, customers are happy, and I think uh, we will be making, I'm very optimistic that we'll be making good progress with TTC to move to a, a different narrative that is more about the future and about the exciting things such as uh, mobile devices for payment, credit cards for payment or open payment would be the story mm -hmm. rather than looking for um, a potential disagreement as the story. Yeah, and at the working level, I'd highlight we've been spending the summer with the TTC as well as the other transit agencies working on this future roadmap in parallel to working with our vendors to actually do the planning. And the TTC have been active and positive participants in that process. So I'm I'm enthusiastic about the future, and I think where there are outstanding discussions, um, we just need to not let that distract us from getting our jobs done. Okay. Other any other questions on any of these reports? Okay. Thank you. Excellent. Okay, so uh, we'll take a break, and um, why don't we, uh, seeing as we're a little late starting, here it is now, uh, 2.35, uh, well, let's uh, go to uh, 2.50, I guess, well, we can afford 15 minutes. Thank you. Thank you.